Thank you everybody for joining us today. Um, this is our Cincinnati Asian Art Society, our September 17th, 2023 program. And I'm Helen Rinsberg, president of the society. Today, we have an absolutely fabulous program. The Damascus Room at the Cincinnati Art Museum, a fascinating journey to the 18th century, Damascus, Syria. Our presenter is Dr. Anke Shiraz. She will take us on an intriguing journey through the 100 years of history of the Damascus Room, which is on display in the Cincinnati Art Museum. After studying conservation at the Academy of Fine Arts in Dresden, Dr. Shiraz has been working as a freelance conservator and scholar for more than 25 years. In 1997, the director of the Ethnographic Museum in Dresden discovered a nearly forgotten disassembled Damascus room. Dr. Shiraz became involved in developing the conservation plan for it and became captivated by the beautiful paintings and decorative techniques. Her research on this forgotten painting techniques and historic materials became the subject of various professional articles and her PhD thesis, including multiple field trips to Damascus. From there, Dr. Shiraz has led research and conservation projects on Damascene interiors in various private and public collections around the world, including the Metropolitan Museum of Art, Doris Duke's Shangri-La in Honolulu, the Museums of Islamic Art in Berlin and Doha, and the Los Angeles County Museum of Art, among others. She has also worked in Damascus for private house owners, as well as for the Aga Khan Trust for Culture. Um, I had the, the pleasure of actually meeting Dr. Anke, Dr. Shiraz, um, with Ainsley, our curator who is here today, and um, we are in for a treat. Thank you and welcome Anke to our program today. Hello everybody, and thank you very much for the kind introduction, Helen. And I'm super grateful for the invitation to take you to this journey today. And yeah, let's get started. This is actually the situation in the Islamic galleries at the Cincinnati Art Museum. And if you are standing in this room, you will face this uh, wooden door and the two um, windows above the doors. And here you actually have the rare chance and yeah, unique possibility in a way to actually enter an object. Uh, this is the Damascus room at the Cincinnati Art Museum. And you will be able to see these beautifully painted panels and doors. And if you turn around, you will have this view to the other wall. This is actually an image taken in the 1990s. So it looks a little different today. If you go there, you will find like a little uh, bit different appearance. But yeah, I just uh, use this image to give an impression of the room. And as you can see here, the room is assembled from various panels and pieces and a an, uh, wooden ceiling as well, carved and painted. And yeah, I have the pleasure today to introduce technical details as well as the history of these panels. Maybe you are puzzled as well as I was for many years why this room actually is on display in Cincinnati today. And this is according to archival material and of course to the history uh, is related to Andrew Jürgens, who were, obviously became fascinated with the art of the Middle East while traveling to this region. And based on archival material that is preserved in the museum's archive, um, it's clear that he commissioned this room um, that's on display today in the museum for his own private residence in his villa in Cincinnati. When going down to the uh, caption, we can see that all the details wrote, um, written and drawn in white, it's actually the present state of a room that he called the sunroom 
in his villa in Cincinnati and all the elements written in uh, and drawn in yellow inside the drawing um, uh, reflect the details that the architect at the time inserted to uh, give an idea to um, for dimensions and how the room uh, that Jürgens was going to commission for his house uh, should look like. And when going back to the, the caption, uh, we can see that this information in yellow was given to G. Uh, Asfa in October 1932. And 20 years back, I even wouldn't know who or what Asfa is. But uh, while working on so many other Damascene interiors, this name became very familiar to me because George Asfa is one of the members of a famous um, antique uh, company, antique uh, trade company called Asfa and Sarkis, which um, made business from the 1890s until the 1960s um, in Damascus. And George Asfa was one of the important figures who um, was involved in preparing Damascene interiors for sale to um, clients such as Hagop Kevorkian, who purchased two interiors in the 1930s. One of them is actually on display today in the Metropolitan Museum of Art. And another room was assembled uh, 20 years later for Doris Duke. She also commissioned a room to refurbish her one of her guest rooms in the 1950s. And another interior is actually pretty close to Cincinnati. It's a room that was purchased by the Cathedral of Learning and is called today the Syria Lebanon classroom. And you can visit it in the University of Pittsburgh. And Asfa and Sarkis actually work closely together with a restoration company in Damascus. We have archival evidence, at least for the decades between the 1930s and the 1950s. So we can certainly assume that the Al Khayyad family also worked together with um, Asfa and Sarkis to assemble the room that Andrew Jürgens uh, commissioned in the 1930s. And it's actually very likely that the panels that we can see today in Cincinnati were partially or fully taken out of houses that were destroyed or heavily damaged by the French bombing that happened in 1925. And the gallery, the sales gallery of um, Asfa and Sarkis was actually located in the Bazaar Suk al Hamidiyah. This is um, the roof with the red arrow shows the roof of the bazaar building. So um, we can safely assume, assume that Asfar and Sarkis had connections to the house owners who yeah, uh, uh, rebuilt uh, new houses in these properties and uh, would give away the remains of the wooden interiors that were part of the historic houses in this area. The earliest evidences of Andrew Jürgens' interior is for black and white images that are preserved in the archival material of the Cincinnati Art Museum. And they show actually the room, more or less as we can see it today in the museum. And when going to the, close, uh, to the corners of the historic photographs, we can see in each of them an embossed stamp uh, with the name Photo Shawi Damas, which is a quite um, famous photographer um, company in Damascus. So this, um, I think we can safely assume that the room was fabricated in Damascus and assembled as an entire interior, photographed, and then these images were sent maybe for approval, but for sure to be a guidance to uh, when the room was assembled in Jürgen's villa. The panels uh, clearly have um, like a numbering code on the backside that also helps 
as a guidance to assemble the room. The next evidence we have is actually a postcard that you can see on the left side. This shows the situation when the room was assembled in the Cincinnati Art Museum after it was donated by Jürgens in 1966. And this uh, location was actually in the basement gallery where part of the Islamic collection was displayed until the room moved to its current location uh, in the early 1980s. And you still can see that the gallery had still the wooden floor. And in the early 1990s, the room was equipped with a marble mosaic floor and these low benches with uh, damascene silk fabrics. This is actually the situation as you can see it today when visiting the museum. Um, all the historic um, panels are decorated with floral and geometric motifs, and I will introduce some of them later in the talk. But for now, I want to introduce some of the important features of this room. As you can see, there are a number of paired uh, doors and panels inscribed with Arabic calligraphy, as well as the beautifully adorned wooden ceiling. Then we have two entry doors and um, various niches, wall niches, for the display of valuable items. And I will talk a little bit later about the niche on the left side. And of course, the panels are painted with um, certain patterns and um, decorative elements, such as fruit bowls and flower vases, as well as tiny landscapes. So it's like little stylized sceneries. Um, and the entire surface is actually decorated with uh, raised ornaments. This is um, a technique called Ajami in Arabic. And Ajami actually means Persian in Arabic or non-Arabic in the meaning of like some precious items from the East, which refers actually to the um, taste of the Damascene inhabitants who were very much in favor of um, Persian ornaments and uh, Persian fabrics and thus it's um, used to decorate the interiors in their private homes. This uh, term Ajami is used for the ornaments as well as for the technique to create them as well as for the entire interiors. So if you hear the term Ajami room, it refers to these wooden paneled interiors from Damascus. And I'd like to introduce briefly how these panels were created because it's really fascinating, not only for me being a conservator, but you will see it's quite stunning. At first, the poplar wood would be coated with a white prime made from uh, gesso and glue. And then the ornaments would be transferred with stencils and charcoal powder, as you can see here. Or the inscription panels would be actually transported to the workshop of a calligrapher. And this person would uh, write the beautifully calligraphy directly on the wooden boards. And then these boards would go back to the artisan's workshop. The next step would be the um, application of a thick, thick flowing paste, also made from gypsum and glue, um, achieving all these raised ornaments, as you can see it here. Next, the surface would be overlaid by metal foils and leaves. Um, large areas are actually overlaid by tin foil, all the areas that look silvery. It's not silver, it's actually tinfoil. Mm -hmm. But we find also a lot of copper alloy leaf used that originally had a golden appearance like brass. And we also have uh, multiple areas that are overlaid by real gold leaf. Um, large parts of the tinfoil areas were then coated by tinted glazes in four colors. So we have yellow, orange, red, and green. 
in some interiors, like in Cincinnati, the green aged to a brownish shade. That's why it looks a little different than it was in the beginning when it was made in the first place. And the next step would be the uh, painted ornaments and painted flowers, as you can see it here. And it's kind of a little bit of tricky for a conservator or also for the preservation of such interiors because the pigments are used in various mixtures of binding media. Some are mixtures of egg and glue, some contain oil, and some of them are made from pure resin media. So when working with solvents or cleaning uh, materials on these surfaces, one really needs to know which paint is made in which um, media. And one of them is particularly fascinating. It's actually a blue color that it's made using blue glass powder. It's called smalt. The pigment is called smalt. And if this blue glass powder is mixed with egg white or animal glue, then the artisans achieved a bright blue color, as you can see it here or in the next examples. Um, but if the same pigment is used with oil or resin, it would uh, produce a black color. So um, today you cannot see this bright blue color in the room in Cincinnati, but you will, I will show you later that it's actually still there. And maybe with future conservation, a part of it could be brought back. Yeah, here's a detail of a um, um, little fruit bowl in Cincinnati. And the entire background was actually the same bright blue um, used with a um, glass powder. But only in few damages we can sneak into and beneath the varnish layer. That um, is the reason why the original blue color uh, appears black today. You should imagine uh, the surface in the room rather in this kind of color scheme. And this image also shows nicely how the contrast between matte painted uh, areas and the glossy metal uh, surfaces would appear in the first place. Um, now I would like to introduce a little bit the original context where these panels actually came from and for which purpose they were made. They were originally part of a reception, room the reception rooms for guests in the private homes of Damascene um, inhabitants. And the most important room of the entire house was the reception room for guests. And because of that, this room was the most elaborate and most costly furnished room of the entire house. When walking outside such houses, the outside walls are entirely not spectacular at all. You just see simple walls and some rooms overhanging the streets. And if you enter one of these doors, you are suddenly standing in such beautiful courtyards that are adorned with a beautiful marble mosaic flooring, lush greenery, you would smell the scents of jasmine or roses or orange blossoms. And in almost every house, uh, you would find a fountain that gives the beautiful sound of the water. The south wing of such a house would have like a large open hall, such as this one. It's called Iwan. And this space actually was used most of the year as like an outdoor living room where the family would meet and business partners uh, would meet. Um, yeah, it's like an outdoor uh, space. But if the temperature is too high or too low, then the rooms inside the building would be used and one would enter through such a door um, and would stand in a kind of entry space that is called Atabel, Atabel in uh, Arabic, which means threshold. And you would face such a niche. And if you lift your head, you would see a beautifully adorned wooden ceiling cap capping this um, space. 
And if you turn your head a little bit further, you would see another ceiling, almost looking like a flying carpet. And you can see that the rooms in most cases were separated with a wooden, uh, with an, a stone arch and sometimes also with a wooden arch. And when going down, you would see this uh, raised seating area. That's the main space of the reception room for guests. And these rooms actually are usually pretty tall, pretty high. They can reach a height of 10 meters or 32 feet. And the ones that were rather used in winter that, how to say, are easier to heat, they would be of a height of 16 feet or like five, six meters high as, yeah, you can see it in these examples. Because these rooms were not used with heavy furniture, all the architectural elements in the walls were made for specific purposes. As you can see, it has the rooms have uh, wall niches and wall closets. And the open wall niches were used to display, for example, valuable, valuable items of the families. Could be porcelain collections, it could be any other valuable items that are in the possession of the families. Or like on the left side, if a scholar lived in such a house, the shelf niches would be filled up with um, precious books. Um, as you can see, the room in Cincinnati has quite a number of these uh, wall cabinets. They could be either small or large and have uh, certain names. And they were also used to store the um, belongings of the family. As you can see, the ceilings usually rest on a, a white washed plaster band and they rather look like baldachins or yeah, actually like flying carpets. They never rest directly on the wooden panels as we see it today in the Damascus room in Cincinnati because this is, um, this how to say the reason for the different situation is that the room in Andrew Jürgen's house existed already and that the buildings, of course, or the interiors um, outside Syria are not that tall as we see it here in the original houses. This upper wall zone is historically equipped with uh, glass gypsum windows to provide the room with light. And these windows are actually made by stained glass gypsum windows. As you can see a few of the rarely preserved examples here in these images. And these historic windows obviously influenced some one element of Jürgen's interior. It's actually two gypsum glass windows that are today installed above the entrance, but were installed in Andrew Jürgen's villa behind two uh, wall closets. And we can see in the map that was sent to Asfalan Sarkis that these glazed um, pierced plaster windows were uh, ordered by um, Jürgens and his architect to be placed behind the shutters. So it's clear that these windows are not uh, like original pieces. They were made uh, in the tradition of the old um, stained glass windows, but yeah, matching the purpose of um, Jürgen's commission. Then a quite striking element of the room, it's this niche with this um, stalactite voting. Um, many people assume that this is a prayer niche, but it's actually not. Um, it's a particular niche that you will find in the historic houses in Damascus facing the entry of such an, a reception room for guests. And this is actually the place where the water ewer would be placed. And the name of this particular niche also refers to pouring water. And that's why it's called Mishab in Arabic. And you can see other examples in other historic rooms as well as in museum installations. And the closest uh, Mukarna's hood. Mukarna's is the term for this um, stalactite uh, type of decoration. 
is actually the sub that's today part of the Damascus Room at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. And these rooms were sold both at the same time in, in 1933. And maybe both uh, niches originate from the same house because many of these large houses in the old city of Damascus did not contain only one of these precious interiors. The houses had um, up to five or seven courtyards and each of them would have such a reception room. That's why it's not so surprising to have like similar or very, very similar um, elements. But the uh, rare walls of these niches, both are like kind of fantasy creations for sale because the original niches um, are always equipped with a rare wall made from marble mosaic. And for Cincinnati, the artisans produced uh, wooden panels painted in the same style as the historic interiors, uh, the historic ornaments. And the room in New York today uh, had been equipped with um, tiles, as you can see here. But, you know, all the rooms I was able to visit in Damascus are that are documented, they contain marble mosaics. And we can imagine that it's quite easy to remove the wooden panels or remove uh, marble mosaics. And I guess this is one of the reasons why they were uh, commonly um, left in the houses. Now I would like to draw your attention to the, I would say the most important element of these historic interiors. It's the inscription panels. And um, calligraphy had really in high value and still has in high value in the Middle East. And that's why these panels are so important. And often these historic interiors contain poems of medieval poets like Al-Razali, Al-Burai, Al-Busiri. But in Cincinnati, thanks to um, Claudia Ott, who is a German Arabist and specialist in Arabic poetry, uh, I can tell you that the inscription contains verses of a poem of a quite contemporary uh, poet and scholar. Uh, Abdel Rani al Nabulsi was quite a famous scholar of its time and also a famous poet and mystic. And um, that's why it's pretty interesting to find this kind of contemporary poem inscribed on the walls. The last poem, uh, the last verse of these poems um, contains actually the date for the uh, completion of the room. And it reads, um, 1123, which would translate to uh, 1710, 1711 of the Christian calendar. Um, but when um, examining this panel more closely during my visit uh, to Cincinnati, I discovered that the one of the numbers was obviously changed. Uh, now it reads like a two. This is this kind of hook in the center of this image. But you can see that um, surrounding this number, there is a shape that looks like a V. Um, so this means it would be um, the, num the numer numeral seven in Arabic. So it seems that the restoration company changed the date to make the room look a little older. It's not entirely clear yet. So we still <laughs> are in the stage of researching it properly, but yeah, it to me, it seemed very clear that the date was a little bit manipulated, but this does not um, make the room less value. It's just fascinating to see how the antique dealers, um, yeah, made their business, I would say. The ceiling also has inscriptions and it's beautifully interwoven Arabic letters. And this actually contains the first part of a surah from the Quran. And this same calligraphy appears six times in the ceiling. 
So it's quite a common way of having beautifully um, inscribed Arabic um, parts of the Quran. And now I would like to introduce other details that are depicted on these elaborate panels. You may have noticed the design of the framework of the Damascus Room in Cincinnati that has a nice floral design. And as you can see in the other um, examples I'm showing here, that it's quite a common design throughout the 18th and early 19th century in Damascus. Uh, it appears on ceilings as well, like on this in this house in Damascus, as well as in the room that's today the Damascus room in Doris Duke's um, Shangri-La in Honolulu. And when looking at textiles, it's quite striking to find similar motifs on Ottoman embroideries of the same time period, as well as on Persian embroideries and uh, Persian fabrics as well. Uh, it means like woven um, fabrics. So it reflects that the taste of the Damascene inhabitants at this time was quite influenced, influenced by um, uh, textile motifs. When looking at the flower vases, you might have recognized already the tiny vases that and if you imagine that the colors um, the theme is a little bit brighter and less yellowish you can imagine these vases looking like blue and white porcelain or ceramics and they appear in other rooms uh, in different materials it could be metal vases it could be glass it could be porcelain as well as ceramics and yeah, the ones that are painted in the um, wall closets in Cincinnati are pretty close to it, to one interior in Damascus that is dated in the late 18th century. And it's actually one of the very rare interiors that survived without any later conservation. Uh, it's one of my favorite houses in the old city in Damascus, the Beit al that's in the center here. And another beautiful one is a house dated in the early 18th century that is today installed in the National Museum in Damascus. Yeah, here's another example showing quite close uh, similarities uh, to the uh, house al Horania in Damascus. And you can see that the blue shades were yeah, more, more blue than uh, um, dark blue like today in Cincinnati. Yeah, here's another example from the same house. And yeah, the blue, the blue, uh, blue color of the blue glass powder is pretty striking here. Then another feature you might have um, detected already are fruit bowls. Um, you can see melons, grapes, cherries, figs, pears, you know, all kinds of fruits that were readily available in the fertile oasis um, that surrounded the city of Damascus. And you would actually be, um, you would, um, the same fruits would be actually served when being a guest in the house, in these houses. So these food bowls, I think, are signs of hospitality um, because it was very important to uh, be a good host in the private houses in Damascus. And another feature, uh, interesting little landscapes. They were called from the 18th century on Stambuli, which refers to Istanbul. Uh, that was the capital of the Ottoman Empire. And Damascus was uh, one of the provincial capitals uh, during the Ottoman era. Yeah, they are quite common and they appear firstly in the 1770s. So we can quite safely assume that the 
pieces decorated with landscapes in Cincinnati were made between 1770 and like early 19th century. There are other elements um, that belong to the acquisition that Jürgens made for his villa that are not on display today and uh, kept in storage. And this is actually window shutters um, that were used to um, enable to close the windows in the historic houses when the rooms were not in use. Um, like these examples show for, yeah, as you can see. And the hand-drawn map for the acquisition for Jürgen's room actually shows doors that should um, close closets that the architect designed. And the, uh, the two pairs of window shutters, of historic window shutters, were actually used as doors for these closets. And these two pairs of closets are actually very fascinating because this is the only example I found so far where little churches are drawn. Usually it's um, rather sceneries with um, mosques and houses, but of course Damascus had an, a large area, like a Christian quarter, and um, this, these window shutters obviously survived from one of the Christian houses in Damascus, which is pretty rare because this area was also heavily damaged and um, burned down in 1860. And that's why only very few examples survived from any of the Christian houses. If you visit one of the rooms in Damascus today or in the collections abroad, you will mostly see such brown glossy surfaces, but they are actually caused by varnish layers that were applied to these rooms to maintain them or to refresh colors. But these um, layers are dark by time. So it means in the beginning they were transparent but after a few decades, they become brown or yellow and become also very brittle. So when removing these varnish layers, um, we could reveal the original um, color scheme of these interiors. And as you can see, it's quite a difference um, of the historic um, paintings. Yeah, as you can see, it's quite a change from this like greenish appearance to the beautiful contrast of light blue and gold and pink. Or you see, um, you can see it's quite a drast drastic change of the surface appearance when removing these varnish layers. Yeah, or this example, it's a house that's still in Damascus. And it looks quite dramatic, the change. Um, but in this room, the original surface was in such a good condition. It's really incredible. And my colleague, Shadi Khalil, who works in Damascus for more than 15 years, um, he was able to remove the varnish in this interior, for example. And you can see the nice contrast between the glossy um, gilded surfaces and the matte painted areas, as well as the areas with uh, reddish um, tinted glazes on top of tinfoil. So it's really amazing. And yeah, when looking at the Damascus room in Cincinnati today, you could imagine how bright the original surface uh, would have looked like of this interior or of the elements of the historic interiors. But this, these darkened varnishes are not only um, an issue of like taste or aesthetics, um, they also cause um, serious damages when being too old. As you can see in this example, this, the varnish layers become more and more brittle and really develop tension inside the varnish layer. And this causes the delamination of the thin 
paint layer. Um, so luckily in Cincinnati, it did not happen yet. Most of the areas uh, seemed very stable. But when looking closely, uh, some of the areas show like first signs of this type of um, damage that certain um, tiny bits start flaking or like losing contact to the ground below. But yeah, all the decorative features I was able to study in Cincinnati in June were of high quality and in really good condition. So you're very lucky to have this beautiful room in Cincinnati. And maybe future conservation could bring back a little bit of the original intended color scheme that the artisans uh, painted 200 years ago or 250. Um, yeah, I hope you enjoyed the talk and thank you very much for your attention. Who's the first question? Okay, Jill Lynn. Okay, I'm repeating all of the questions to make sure Anke hears them. So the question, Anke, yeah. is that as we're in the room, a lot of times we are seeing very dark colors, very black brown. Can we assume that they originally might have been that blue? And I know you and I discussed green at one point too. Yeah, um, the background of the inscription panels that look black today, it's clearly blue because we found like tiny bits that remained. And the, uh, all the background colors of the um, the food bowls, they are clearly uh, blue. I mean, they were blue, um, but you know, because of the varnish, they are black today. Okay. Um, and there are a lot of um, blossoms actually, like flowers that look like dark greenish and they are um, blue as well, light blue with dark blue um, outlines. You've mentioned stained glass gypsum windows. Can you explain a bit more about how these are made compared to the Western stained glass windows that we're familiar with? Yes, of course. Um, you would have like a wooden frame, um, like, yeah, like a frame. And the whole frame would be filled with gypsum, like a liquid gypsum, uh, like for, uh, what is it called? For uh, make moldings or cast with gypsum. So it would be like uh, filled. And when uh, drying, um, the artisan would cut like all these holes into the gypsum. So you would have like tiny holes. And when the gypsum panel uh, is dry, the holes would be filled with like tiny pieces of colored glass. Um, and this oh. is how they are made. Yeah. It's a very old technique. It's very common um, in Egypt as well as in, you know, many areas. Um, and these windows were actually placed, I mean, the walls are like uh, 70 centimeter thick. How much feet is it? Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, it's yeah, like this, the walls and the windows would be placed in the interior side. So they would not be uh, touched by water. So they are pretty stable and they can last like for decades or centuries. Um, for Ainsley. For those of you on Zoom that don't know her, is our conservator of South, I mean, curator of South Asian art, Islamic art and antiquities. And so she is leading this charge to raise funds to have that varnish removed. And it could be a two to three year project to have that removed on that. Yeah, that when I got to meet with Angela and Anke, that was for me exciting. Um, I do want to say that the fee for Dr. Anke's talk was paid by the members of the Cincinnati Asian Art Society who contributed to our conservation fund. Um, so yes, question. How is the varnish removed, Anke? <laughs> yeah, it depends. Um, uh, that's why, how to say, the next step would be like for, for conservator who would work on this room would be to make tests on all the different areas on like the different painted areas, as well as on the uh, glazes to make sure that the solvent that can remove the varnish does not, um, 
harm the original surfaces. So we work with different mixtures of solvents. And, you know, I worked in so many rooms already, but each room needs a specific um, treatment strat strategy because they all behave differently uh, because all these complex materials age differently. And then it depends how they were treated. Um, so that's why, yeah, we need to find which material works on all surfaces in the same degree. Does that help? I mean, it's complicated. <laughs> so um, it's a lot of chemistry that we need to know. How much has the Syrian army damaged the rooms, I presume, that are left in Syria? Um, Have you been I back? Mean, yeah, no, I, I haven't been back yet, um, but I have close contacts to my friends and colleagues in Damascus still. And um, luckily, um, the war in Damascus was in the suburban areas, not in the old city, as it happened in Aleppo. It's totally different in Aleppo. And in Damascus, um, the houses still exist. Um, there are between three and 5,000 houses still existing. And we assume that about 200 to 300 have this type of interior still. And as I showed, one of my colleagues is, um, you know, working on them still. Um, there is rather a problem that um, many historic cities uh, face, not only in Syria, that people buy property and turn torn down these houses because they don't want to live in an old historic house. This is rather a problem um, and not the wall. For the couches that we have in ours, um, the patterns that are there are, are those original designs and um, would they have been soft to sit on yeah. or rather firm? We have uh, information in uh, written travel accounts, like from, you know, European travelers to the to Damascus and to Aleppo, who describe um, the interiors in the 18th and early 19th century. And they describe that the people would sit on low mattresses that are only like 10 centimeter tall, like this, like low mattresses. And they were covered with uh, various fabrics. And as far as I know, um, it always, or as far as I learned from, you know, working with historians and art historians and um, so sociologists, I think that's the word, <laughs> uh, who work, you know, on how um, the society lived. Uh, it's related to the wealth of the family because the most affluent families, of course, could afford like silk fabrics to be used on their um, cushions and these mattresses. We have one description uh, by an um, English traveler who traveled to Damascus in 18, 1835. And he actually describes um, a room that was um, completed by, of this time, the most the wealthiest man in Damascus. And he describes the yellow silk, the yellow Damascene silk that was used uh, for the cushions of this room. And this room actually is uh, known today um, as the grape room in Beit Nizam. So it's one of the most famous rooms in Damascus. And the, how to say, the families who are less affluent, they would rather um, use fabrics that were not so expensive, like cotton prints, for example, or uh, fabrics, woven fabrics available in the market in Damascus, um, but not so costly. And the wealthier the family, the more precious the carpet would be. The wealthiest families would have like really expensive Persian carpets and like, like uh, medium families or like poorer families would have like simpler carpets of course I think it's like today like the wealthy families you know can uh, pay a fortune for uh, textiles um, or like goods in the houses and I think it was the same in Damascus sort of that way around the world on that one okay yeah, Beth exactly. yeah. 
back to and, this. I mean, path. Damascus, Damascus was one of the most important uh, centers of commerce uh, 250 years ago. It was one of the, um, um, what is it, like end, end points of the Silk Roads before trading mm. to Europe. So you could buy almost anything in the market in Damascus and Aleppo. So goods from China, between England and China were traded from Russia to the south of the Arabian Peninsula. You could buy anything you could afford. We do have a textile that's just been rotated into the, the Mitra Gallery 143 um, that was particularly made for the Ottoman Empire. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I prepared a different talk oh. Um, uh, where I showed uh, a lot of the painted uh, pattern and uh, how to say, put it beside um, actual fabrics um, from India, from Iran, from the Ottoman Empire. Um, so, I mean, this would be another talk <laughs> to go <laughs> deeper in this subject. Right. <laughs> but this is something I'm hunting for 20 years now because I always was interested what you know, the people in Damascus would choose to be painted on their walls because it's their most important room and nothing is, you know, coincidence there. And that's why I was interested, mm -hmm. you know, what shaped their taste in a way. Mm -hmm. um, I do want to acknowledge that Shakar and Anumitra are here who are um, our patrons for that gallery. And I'm, I would like to know from your experience, how does our Damascus room compare to the rooms that you have seen as you have done your work? The, how to say, the paintings are very well preserved because uh, in many others I worked, um, they are like heavily overpainted already, like when, when they were prepared for sale. Um, and um, they have a lot of in painting, for example, or the room that's on display in the, uh, at the Metropolitan Museum has actually four varnish layers, which makes the room pretty dark, almost black. So much, much darker than in Cincinnati. Um, and what I like really, or what I found really interesting in Cincinnati is that you have so many pieces from different rooms, but it really gives you an idea of, you know, how these rooms in Damascus in the 18th century would have looked like. So it's like a little universe in itself. And that's why I really like it. And it's fascinating to see, you know, um, how they assembled it to make it an entire whole again for Andrew Jagens. And the ceiling actually might be one of the early examples because I found only two like kind of similar ceilings and they are obviously made like in the late 17th century or early 18th century. But yeah, since only very few of these type of uh, ceilings survived, I cannot say much about that yet. Um, I'm still, you know, digging and digging in material and publications and, you know, um, so, but, you know, guessing from my experience or, yeah, uh, I would say this is like pretty early. and. And because Damascus was hit by heavy earthquakes in 1759, there are very, very few examples left from the time before the mid 18th century. So, yeah, so that's why I think your room is pretty special. Remember when, Anke, when I interviewed you for Cam Look, that your quote was, it's a gem of a room. Yeah, it is. You know, when thinking of Doha, I mean, the Museum of Islamic Art in Doha reopened last year and um, I helped to uh, do the conservation of this room. Half of the room was overpainted, which is quite a large amount of surface. So, and we were not able to bring back um, most of the original in these overpainted areas. So this is something that did not happen to most of the um, elements in, in Cincinnati when when it was, you know, prepared for sale. At what point did Arabic artists start using landscapes and pictorial elements as opposed to only calligraphy and geometric shapes? Um, the landscapes, the oldest or the earliest uh, room we found was landscapes. It's dated 1775. It's in a collection in Beirut, a private collection. And, you know, other houses in Damascus. 
So, and it starts actually with tiny small landscapes that are interwoven in the ornamental uh, decoration. And then they get bigger and bigger as we see it in Cincinnati, for example, on like entire panels. Um, and then later in the early century, they even were painted on the wall zone between ceiling and uh, paneling. So they start tiny and then get bigger and bigger. So it's really fascinating to see. And what was the other question about the de um, de geometric ornaments? When do they change from the geometric to landscape? Uh, no, it's always a mixture. Um, and it's often even a revival of uh, Mamluk ornaments that became in fashion again in the 19th century as well. So um, what we also need to emphasize, emphasize is that each room um, is a creation discussed by the taste of the owner builder and the artisan. So when a family is rather traditional, they might choose a um, pattern that look more like uh, old style. And then we have some of them, maybe they have relatives in living in Istanbul or in Baghdad or Isfahan that are, you know, ahead of time. Uh, so they might be influenced by, you know, uh, objects or things they have seen and wanted to have in their own reception room. So that's why um, we cannot say uh, in this decade, this style appeared, uh, or in this decade, this motif disappeared. Um, you know, I've seen about 200 of these rooms, um, most of them dated, and I was rather fascinated how the families, together with the artisans, mixed and choose, you know, their uh, palette of uh, decorative elements for each single room. Yeah. I want to say that Shakar is asking about the very great difference between what you see inside uh, lavishly, um, belovedly ornamented compared mm -hmm. to the outside, which is so plain. Is there something mm -hmm. in the culture that has that contrast? I got it. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's just not common to show off um, on the outside. You just show off um, inside the houses. And these houses, they have like, or these reception rooms for guests have kind of like a semi-public function um, because it was not only like family visits that happened. It was business partners that met in these rooms. Um, uh, the judge would also come to the houses and would help solve um, like legal issues. Um, so these, these rooms have like really, they re really reflect on, you know, on the social status of the families, as well as on their education, on their background. You know, it's it's like a, a very fine code that you could read, but nothing is uh, shown off on the um, outside of these buildings. That's just part of the, uh, yeah, part of the culture. And this is for, for centuries like this. Were the wall decorations using metal backgrounds for the painted layers to allow for the low light conditions of the room and their eras of or origination, thus allowing greater reflectivity of ambient light? As you can see in these images, the rooms were pretty um, lit up because the, how to say, the sun is extremely bright in Damascus and the courtyards are covered with like white or light marble and the walls were uh, whitewashed. So the light is really reflected by these white walls inside the room, inside the rooms. But the fascinating thing is actually that the rooms change during the day, because if the light is very intense um, at noon, you would see like the bright colors and you would see less the metal surfaces. And if you come in the morning or in the evening, suddenly, like the metal surface would start glowing or like a uh, mother of pearl inlays that certain elements also have in the walls. And this is something I discovered when working in these rooms and actually living in such houses when sitting in such a room for like two or three hours, the room changes around you. And this is, it's, it's really special when talking about it, getting goosebumps, it's really special because I, th I, I'm convinced that the artisans and the owner builders knew 
that when being a visitor in such a room, um, you should not be bored. You should always be able to discover tiny details or when the room changes around you, it's, yeah, it's something, something very special. I think it's very important for, you know, being a good host, being, uh, having the high value of hospitality to have these extraordinary uh, decorated surf surfaces to to let people enjoy a long stay in these rooms and even even coming back several times so there's mm. always something to discover even if you stay in such a room for two months you will still discover something new and this was really one of the really or still is one of the fascinating things that I could not leave my hands from these rooms because they are just never boring what resins are we talking about that were used in these rooms? Most of them, are, uh, I mean, the later resins you mean, or the original ones? The original resins. The original resins, as far as we know, um, it's uh, resins that were cooked with oil to make like an oil lacquer. And it could be uh, from, uh, it's called sandarak, sandarus in Arabic. It's from pistachio tree. Or it could be a pine resin, um, like not colophonium, it's too, the quality is too bad, like mastic, dama, you know, resins that stay pretty flexible and do not become so brittle like colophonium, for example, because the later varnishes often were made by using a high amount of colophon, um, and that's why they age so badly. Uh, this is something that the original lacquers do not do. I've seen rooms like, you know, currently I work in the Aleppo room in Berlin, which is 400 years old. And the original lacquers are extremely stable and well-preserved. And they are like oil. I mean, they heat oil and cook them with um, melting resins. This is what we know from um, historic tree traces. But to do like a proper chemical analog, of these organic materials, it's very difficult because when it's uh, covered with a later resin, uh, the chemists cannot um, distinguish between the old and the new uh, resin. That's why um, there is not mm. so much proper research done yet because yeah, it's extremely rare to find a room that was never treated. So what was the pigment used for the blue in the glass? Uh, it's cobalt glass. I mean, it's the same uh, oh. blue glass that, I mean, the the chemical element cobalt makes uh, glass blue, either on ceramics, on glass, on enamel. It's all co It's always cobalt. And um, this uh, pigment, it's crushed cobalt glass. It's really glass particles. How were the rooms lit at night? Oil lamps? <laughs> Good question that I had myself. Um, as far as I learned from an historian who works in Tor Toronto, um, we know or we can assume that these rooms were just not used at night because there's no place to put like either a candle or an oil lamp. No. I think. And, and then the historian, um, he worked on, uh, what is it called? If a person dies, then there is like, is this a heritage? What what the family inherits? Oh, will. I forgot the English term. Yeah. So when there is lists of these kind of things that, you know, go from one generation to another, like in court records. And uh, it's surprising that the families only bought three candles a month, even the wealthy families. And this, the historian assumed that they just need candles to go to the toilet at night, but there was no, you know, Nobody uh, did something during night, except for like maybe rare like uh, parties or like a wedding or something when they would lit up um, the courtyard or the rooms, but not for like normal daily use. And I think this is kind of similar to our past, you know, before electricity that most activities did not happen at night, as far as I know. Um, and there was no... 
suit somewhere in the rooms or in some of the niches where you would expect there could be candles, but there was nothing. I never found anything. Oh, that's interesting. Mm -hmm. so it's a question to historians, So, but this is what I learned from, you know, other colleagues. <laughs> the evidence is not there. <laughs> yeah, okay. but I mean, it does no. not mean that it was not, but I mean, to me, it made sense, you know. The question is, is there any photographic evidence of the carpeting that might have been there? But when did mm. photography get to Damascus? Pretty early already in the oh. mid 19th century. But most of the interiors that were photographed are actually foreign consulates. And I'm actually hunting for years already historic images of like real locals in their households. But the photographs photographers obviously did not get access to real families. I found only three images so far depicting real families. One is actually here on the left side, um, but this is like late 19th century. So it's hard to say what they would have like in early 19th century or late 18. Um, so there is no um, uh, historical name. evidence yet i found a description that they um used carpets from Khorasan in damascene households i think it's a description from 1805 but it's just one uh evidence so far i mean imagine that there were like several uh, hundreds of houses it's hard to say um what they would have well one of the problems with photography is of course that original exposure rates were two minutes yeah. with mm. light um, and yeah. film didn't get really sensitive till about 1890. Yeah, Is there any photo photographic evidence of what the Jurgens had or what they were selecting from? No. Um, mm. What, what, my assumption is, as well, I, I think Ainsley thinks the same, <laughs> um, that the images that we have, the four images showing um, the room when it was um, set up in Damascus, all the furniture and carpets were provided from Asfa and Sarkis, as they did it for other clients. So they did not only uh, sell the um, the wooden paneling, they also furnished it in what they believed would be the real oriental style. So I found that in a letter uh, when they furnished the room for Doris Duke in Honolulu. So he wrote, yeah, according to uh, the real Damascene style, you should use this fabric and this carpet and da, 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 da. So, but this is, you know, 1930s. Um, of course, um, it would be different like in the um, 19th century. But uh, as far as I know, most of the objects that um, were uh, commissioned by Jürgens also uh, went to the museum. So Ainsley might answer um, this question. So you were sort of buying a package deal. Exactly. So you, yeah. you, had, you had the room, you might have had the carpeting, you might have had the couches, you might have, depending on what you wanted to buy. I yeah. Like what? Mm. Yeah. <laughs> Proto idea. Yeah. Right. Um, yeah, and, uh, um, what what I understood when working on these various rooms is that Asfar and Sarkis uh, created like orientalizing fantasy rooms for their clients that would fit the you know perception of their clients. So that's why these rooms are so interesting because it's a time travel not only to 18th century Damascus but also to like to the Roaring Twenties or the 1930s or to Doris Duke's 1950s, you know, what they, you know, uh, how they would, how they see the Orient, if you wish. And then the Orient is what we now know as the Middle East. And then it became Eastern Asia. But anyway. Yeah, and it. even there, yeah. if, if you go to the various cities or regions, I mean, you will find, you know, so many varying objects and styles. So, I mean, it's just the image that the people in the West had in their heads of this region, like Western Asia, for example, mm -hmm. what we call Middle East. So what, but it has what rarely 
yeah. Mm. What was exotic that day, decade? Exactly. Yeah. 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 Okay. Um, Mr. Jurgens installed the room in his house as a sunroom. Mm. Where did the light come from, and did it damage the colors? I think it most of the time it was pretty dark, and as far as I learned, he used it as a library, like you know, or the wall closets that he had. Um, and he had one door that was actually the door to the garden, as we could see in the map. And then he only had these two windows with these stained glass uh, windows. And maybe he opened them when he was inside the room. And he might have had like a few lamps somewhere, like reading lamps or something like that, is what I expect. Um, but it was pretty dark. And most people of this time, uh, they um expected these rooms to be dark like smoking rooms or you know this kind of style so okay. this was pretty fortune for the room if you don't mind Anke, i'd like to say one thing you and i discussed which i found fascinating is um you had mentioned that these rooms were often used for business and yeah. that you told me the story of damascus was a um jumping off place to the hajj to mecca Mm -hmm. And that oftentimes merchants would um, actually sell their goods along the way to, to finance the trip. And so yes, oftentimes of in Damascus, there was a lot of business going on that was funding people's trips to, uh, to Mecca, to the Hajj for the annual pilgrimage. Exactly, because Damascus was not only a um, hub of commerce, it was actually the last gathering place of the pilgrims to Mecca before the caravans were um, heading south through the desert. So Damascus was the last city. And that's why the city every year was flooded with pilgrims between 30 and 60,000 each year. So, and of course, they would bring their goods and would sell their uh, things that they brought to finance, as you said, to finance the Hajj. And this also influenced, you know, the taste when people meeting in the streets or in the houses or in the coffee shops. I mean, um, it was really a metropolitan city at that time. Mm -hmm. you know, um, you know, New York no. was tiny at that time, didn't even exist yet, really. <laughs> <laughs> as well as Cincinnati, I guess. So <laughs> 250 years no, ago. No, we weren't. Well, we had seven. And Damascus was. 5,000 years old already. I mean, yeah, right. Yeah, Cincinnati in 1788 had 17 houses. So, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, <laughs> put it yeah. in perspective on that. I was that technique with egg white could still be used, could, could still be used, and, and how long would it stay blue? How to make an enamel? It's actually the same like uh, painting a uh, blue design on uh, ceramics because it's always like crushed blue cobalt glass that's used and then it melts again and then it becomes this kind of glass layer on metal as an enamel and it can be used as glass powder as well as for paintings as I described it and showed the blue surfaces but if it's just the blue glass powder and not getting melted you need a binding media and that's why it's used with um, egg white or like animal glue. I, I copied such panels. So I used the historic materials or like the chemical analysis showed us which materials were used. And I uh, used the historic materials and trying to find out how much egg white, how much glue would be used mm -hmm. or what would be needed to uh, create the surfaces that I, uh, that I found on the historic interiors. Um, so uh, it's, uh, of course, still pop. Uh, possible to produce the same surfaces and actually with my colleague in Damascus um, with whom I work together for 15 years now we still have the dream to copy one room you know to recreate one room showing the historic uh, vibrant surfaces um, yeah it's always good to dream of something <laughs> <laughs> right uh, we good. know we know now how how to do it how or I think we we know most of, we would say like 80, 90 percent uh, of how the old artisans created these rooms. And we just tr uh, would love to get a little bit closer by using the old techniques and, you know, following their handwriting in a way. Yeah. It's like archaeological, uh, you know, research in a way. 
I have yeah, to divide. Thank you so much up. for all your time and really thank you so much for making me coming to Cincinnati and giving this talk. And it's really a privilege and a pleasure and an honor. Well, Anke, it's been a pleasure to work with you. And um, I'm going to make a pitch again for Ainsley that she is raising the money to um, take that yep. dark varnish <laughs> off the room and uh, bring it back to its as close to its original as possible. Yeah, getting closer. Yeah, yeah, that's the point. Yeah. Getting closer and closer. And well, you know, preserving it for the future because this the, the varnish might be okay for another 10 years, 20, nobody knows, but it will start, you know, uh, pulling it off. This is like, yeah, it's chemically the fact. Mm -hmm. Age has its consequences. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs>